Hello students. This lecture will cover the evolving family, sexual revolution, and safety concerns and violence for adolescents. We're going to start off talking about the evolving family. So things have really changed and young people are pushing back marriage. It is not uh, necessary to get married because of financial reasons. The family itself has really changed and parenting has really changed. Um, because the past few decades have evolved and women have evolved and have the opportunity to establish careers. Uh, uh, we already know that the majority of families, it's a single parent household, uh, predominantly women, uh, not to be surprised. You don't need to get married anymore if you do get pregnant. Uh, societal norms have changed. The views on cohabitation have changed. So many young people uh, just cohabitate. Uh, they just live with someone else and it might be a partner. Uh, it could be for uh, just cohabitating with peers at a much longer time period. You might be in your late 20s still living with a roommate for financial reasons. Uh, and I'm not talking about uh, an intimate relationship just because the economics have changed. So uh, actually in 2014, for the first time, American adults single who were single outnumbered married ones. So the marriage rate has declined and the age when people marry has risen. Um, so very often, uh, people are now marrying in their thirties, uh, definitely. And for a lot of women, a reason to marry later is because you want to establish a career. You're no longer getting married, uh, to have self identity, to be, uh, you know, Mrs. So-and-so, uh, you want to figure out who you are first and then marry. And so this means that people are marrying for better reasons, more romantic reasons than perhaps uh, it was expected that you get married. A woman wasn't going to work in the 1950s. She had to get married to be supported. So things have really evolved. And um, men often don't get married at all at any age. It doesn't matter. There are more men uh, who are likely never to marry at all. So that's interesting. And we're going to be talking later towards the end of the semester about emerging adulthood, which would be the next stage, developmental lifespan stage. Uh, but for those of you who've had me for human growth and development, you know, we know, you know about emerging adulthood and it's like 18 to 29. So you've got kind of this prolongation of adolescence, which is going into this emerging adulthood. So you can almost uh, have a very long period of time of adolescence and emerging adulthood all the way going up to like 30 years old practically. But uh, a lot more young men are living with their families well into their 30s. So uh, things have really changed. The evolving family has really changed. So um, the family dynamics have changed. Um, you know, reasons to get married are love and companionship, not an economic necessity. Um, and then if you do get married, the new evolving family structure is you, if it doesn't work out, you get divorced. You know, you don't stay together for the sake of the family. Uh, the majority of families are single parents. Uh, so it's not necessary to stay in a relationship if the expectations and the needs are not met. Um, another thing is the role. Traditionally, 
you know, the expectation was the husband was the breadwinner and there was clear cut distinctions between them wife's role, the mother's role, the husband's role. Well, that no longer exists and a more democratic form of the family has evolved. And reasons for this are the rise of the feminist movement. Uh, this has given women more uh, economic power and uh, they freedom, freedom to do what they choose. Uh, there's educational opportunities for women as well and an increase in the percentage of women who are working outside the home um, so that is giving more equality in uh, gender roles for the family and sexual capabilities of women uh, the 60s and 70s increased the demand for equality of sexual expression and fulfillment and so that has been a dramatic change in the family because, you know, women get to be free. Uh, and so, uh, and as far as raising children, um, it used to be that raising children was that the focus was the, what the child could do for the family. Uh, they were not the primary consideration in a family it was like they were there uh there's this old adage you know children should be seen but not heard uh but after world war ii there was the development of the child center family and no longer was the focus on what the child could do to serve the family but rather what the family could do to contribute to the total development of the child and that is very important Along with this is the evolving sexual landscape, okay? The sexual revolution began in the 60s, mostly on college campuses, and it gained strength and breadth in the 70s. I hate to tell you this, but I actually went to college in the 1970s, so believe me, it's true. Things really, really changed. Uh, not enough at that time, but it was a huge step forward for us and of course the uh, development of the birth control pill and the fe feminist movement really changed things a lot and then as we evolve gay rights come into play uh, LGBTQ uh, we're really starting to look at people uh, in a more open society uh, we still have a lot of work to do uh, but um, no doubt that the sexual revolution has had some positive and some negative consequences. Um, certainly, um, let's just talk about how the media exposes children to sex. You know, as a parent, I can remember, oh my gosh, there was this TV show called Two and a Half Men. And it was like, I wouldn't, I didn't want my children to watch it because the sexual innuendo was so blatant, you know, everything. And then you're watching TV, everything is about sex, sex, sex. And, you know, until you're a parent, you're like, oh my gosh, you know, you don't realize that TV ads and everything, the media, children are exposed to sex uh, constantly, uh, you know, and this doesn't necessarily uh, mean a good outcome. Uh, it's confusing and it sends, sends mixed messages. And so, you know, that can be a, a difficult thing. Three negative effects of that sexual revolution are an increased rise in STDs, uh, adolescent pregnancies, although pregnancies have decreased dramatically uh, over the past few decades. But um, there is a too early onset of sexual activity. Uh, and, you know, teens are not prepared for sexual activity. They see it everywhere. You see it on the internet. It's sex is exposed in every capacity, but that doesn't mean that the education, the knowledge of preparedness, uh, emotionally, mentally, physically is there. It's just out there in your face 
but without all the knowledge that goes along with it to make it responsible and to really have an understanding of it. Um, so, of course, there are some positive effects of the sexual revolution. It's brought about the acknowledgement that humans are complex sexual beings. Um, you can express yourself sexually and be honest about desires and experiences. Um, and these were things that, you know, uh, everyone was repressed sexually. Uh, so, and lastly, in this episode, we have the evolving safety concerns. Um, it's an increased fear of violence. And a lot of this has to do with this constant media exposure. We see violence all the time. Um, but even though violence is actually down since the mid-90s, uh, the reality is that um, there's a growing uh, perception for Americans that their neighborhoods, their schools are not safe. Of course, school shootings and other high-profile mass killings have really uh, become more common. And since 9-11, awareness of the possibility of terrorism has skyrocketed. skyrocketed. Uh, violent crime, as I said, has really fallen since the 1990s. Um, but uh, there's an overall perception that the United States is becoming an even more increasingly dangerous place to live. Um, and adolescents, this is a really important fact, um, while adolescents are only about 25% as likely to be victims of violent crime in the mid-1990s, more than half of U.S. youth are exposed to violence each year um, within their own families as well. And even though crime rates have decreased, here's an important thing, teenagers are more than twice as likely to be assaulted raped and robbed than persons in any other age group. So that's a really important takeaway. Um, so not only are significant percentages of adolescents involved in violent crime, but all of them have been exposed year after year to physical violence and disturbances of, in the world. Uh, whether it's murders, assassination of leaders, bombings, terrorism. This has, all this is related to instant news, the media. This is going to have emotional and mental ramifications for adolescents, not only now, but in the future. Uh, some have become immune to violence. They're insensitive. It doesn't, you know, whether it's because of computer games I can remember my son one time played a computer game and like this blood was splattering all over the place. I'm like, my God, a little man's limbs were being ripped off. I'm like, how can you, this is like, you know, when you see it, it doesn't mean as much. And he would say, oh, I can turn the blood off. So I'm like, yes, turn the blood off, you know, but it just, it's fascinating to me, uh, you know, what, you know, and he was in his twenties and I'm still, you know, what? This is terrible. Uh, but so that is a, an awful thing. Um, violence in the home. Uh, you know, we're, I'm, I'm creating this video and we're in the middle of the COVID pandemic and violence in the home is increased because everybody is, is stuck at home. Um, so that is un unfortunate. And in adolescents who see this violence, you know, we, we learn this from human growth and development that you know, if an adolescent sees violence in the home, you know, or spousal abuse, partner abuse, they may themselves grow up to be an abuser as well. This is their learned behavior. Um, you know, and stress and unhappiness caused by this abuse could lead to substance abuse, depression, anxiety, suicide. The suicide rate is, is quite high. Um, even though we have increased awareness of cyberbullying, here's a new way of 
giving violence to adolescents and children uh, through bullying, either in person or online. Um, and though it doesn't necessarily mean physical violence, the psychological verbal abuse is it has long-term ramifications. And lastly, uh, the most disturbing development in recent years relates to adolescent mortality. About one third of all American adolescents who die do so from violent acts, suicide or homicide. This is different in the past when most teenage deaths were due to natural causes or accidental deaths, like doing something foolish. Uh, you know, I don't even know what to say about foolish, you know, jumping off a cliff. It just, I don't know, foolish, accidental deaths, driving too fast, something like that. Not about violent acts, suicide, homicide. Um, young people are the, are the this is a, an important statement, Young people are the only age group in the United States that has not, not enjoyed improved mortality over the past 30 plus years. The reason is the increase in vinyl, violent deaths. So that's it for this episode. And we are moving on to a whole different section of in our next episode. So be strong, be good, and I will see you next time.